afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lungi and I'm from Goldmine. Today I'm sitting with two entrepreneurs who've managed to work through opportunities where everyone else found chaos and confusion. And with that, they've been able to build some lasting legacies around them. And they're currently living the journey. Today I'm with Patrick Bituture, um, seasoned entrepreneur, author, and businessman. And I'm also sitting with Alan Tayebwa, who is a CEO at Goldman Finance. Welcome, gentlemen. I'm happy to have this opportunity of sitting down with you and chatting through your journey as entrepreneurs. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, our first question is, was it a passion or were you always business-minded? Yeah, I think uh, I can't say that for sure whether it was a passion or I was business-minded. I think I just took a gamble considering that I was the last born and I always... Uh, I'd always had my siblings talking about the journey they had taken in uh, employment and they kept complaining that they'd never been successful in it. So my gamble was having heard from the business leaders, you know, up to today, uh, they, you know, for example, Patrick and whatever, and, you know, the encouragement they kept giving at the time, I decided to take a gamble on business that in the event that probably 10 years later, if it fails, then I would take the the other journey which my siblings had taken. <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. Um, to be honest with you, my story is one that is business and success out of adversity. All right. Yeah. It is from a background of pain when I lost my dad. I didn't have any ideas. I didn't have any dreams. I didn't have the passion, I can say. But I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. I had to succeed. You have got to put something on the table. You've got to take on responsibility. You've got to have hope that tomorrow will be better than today. Now, because of that, I, got, I found myself providing a product and a service to people. And in the process, it wasn't ultimately for money, but you want to provide a service to people. And when they show you gratitude, they are so happy that you've provided a good quality service or a product, and they pay you for it. That was the bonus. So the satisfaction from providing a good service, from selling sugar, from selling a mobile phone, from selling electricity, from doing something that changes people's lives, brightens them, and they, are gr they show gratitude. Even in the hotel business, when a customer is served and they're happy that you've got good service, that is very rewarding. If in the process you make money, that's a plus. If you don't, you may live with it. You'll still get some gratitude. Hopefully you don't make a loss. That's the story. Oh, that's a um, bit of a hearty story. It got me a little bit emotional, um, but well done. And I'm glad that you're here today. Um, so what do you say to somebody that has the same, you know, experience as you do, Patrick, right? Um, we see people giving up and yet there are so many opportunities. Um, what do you say to that kind of person that actually wants to be you and they have no clue where they want to start? I often talk about quotients. Like most people know what IQ stands for, your intelligence quotient. We go to school, we read books. You become intelligent. That's how you build on your intelligence, by reading many more books, getting experience, exposure. Then there's emotional quotient, the EQ, where you learn to communicate with people, to deal with situations. And at times, it's not about your intelligence. It's how you deal with people, that network you build, whether it's your bankers, your lawyers, your friends, your customers, your stakeholders, you've got to have the emotional quotient. What we often don't talk about enough is ER, which is emotional resilience. And that's what you need to succeed in business. The resilience to try and fail and pick yourself up immediately and keep on. If you have a dream or a passion or a goal, you've got to achieve it. There will be many challenges. You will make mistakes. You will fail several times. But if you keep going and you know what you want ultimately, that resilience, that strength of character, that true grit, that's what most people don't seem to have. And you need that to succeed in business, especially if you're going to scale your business and, and so you cannot rise up and fly like an eagle if you're going to stay with the ducks. You've got to be determined to go the distance. Awesome. Um, Alan, you share the same background as, you know, Patrick. You lost your parents when you were very young. What were you holding to at that time? And where was your mindset in terms of where you wanted to be? Well, I think my mindset was I, I, I knew that I had nothing. They had offered me the education that I needed while I was growing up. And right after the university, I knew that I was all by myself. No one was going to give me anything. No one was going to help me get a job or anything like that. So I had to like, like 
chairman has said, Patrick, I think I had to come on and get that emotional readiness, to get emotionally ready for the journey that I was going to start. Yeah. One of the things that I think uh, I was able to, that was able to help me was to find mentors from the very beginning and find people that I could listen to who had walked the journey and could guide me. So that was, that's one of the things that I think someone who is starting out should be able to pick up. But secondly, I think they should also be able to uh, not easily get tempted. So small successes shouldn't, uh, you know, deter you from the course that you've set out to take. If you have, you should, you should let your business be more successful than you, the owner. Don't, don't look more successful than the business. <laughs> All right. Um... One question that everybody is actually wanting to know out there is how do I build the capex? How do I get the funds to actually start? Do I need funds or do I look at other things in order to start a business? I mean, what's the most important thing? I think the most important thing uh, about business is not so much the capital. All right. I think it's, you know, the idea, the, 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 the product, you know, the, 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 ideally the three Ps, the people, the product, and the... But one of the ways, if I'm to use my story, uh, one of the ways that I was able to source capital was through my relatives, because no one knew me. No bank would be able to give me any financing at the time. Right. So I had to start with what I had. And who I had was to pitch to my relatives. Of course, I was pitching, looking for a lot of money, 20 million shillings, and I only got 2 million shillings, <laughs> Right. And what I got is what I started with. But the principles in business were still the same. That with two million shillings, with so little what I was able to make, I still could pay myself a salary off that. So I think for me, I'll, I'll just let Patrick tell us. Well, there are two types of um, capital. And uh, to the ordinary person, we understand equity, which is money that you put in, your own money or your family's money. And then there's debt. Now, normally you can't access debt unless you have a track record of making the equity grow, showing the people who your friends, he borrowed from his family, they supported him, they believed in him. So they give you the little bit of money. You show them that their money is safe. You invested it and it grows and you can pay it back. That's the first step. You build a track record. Then if you go to a bank, you start banking with them. And you bank for some time, they look at the track record. So that when you ask for a loan, the loan is a function of how you've been running your account. So the most important thing, other than saying, I need capital, is discipline. People underestimate the value of discipline. Whether you have a, lit a little money or a lot of money, you need the discipline. You need the structures so that capital is reserved as capital. You know how much you've got to pay, you know what your interest is, you know what your dividend or profit is. And if you can keep those buckets apart, then you succeed. When I look at the people, especially in our region, in East Africa, Many people don't have that discipline. And that's what differentiates us from the Asians, for instance. Indians, Chinese, Japanese, they have a culture of discipline. From an early childhood, it's inbuilt in their values. There's discipline. They learn to say no. They use what they can and they use it carefully. The word frugality is just part of them. They are careful. So those values are what help you. When you have them, they form your character. You build a reputation. Then accessing capital becomes a little bit easier. It's never going to be enough. Even the richest countries in the world, America, Japan, you find people, they don't have enough capital. But you use what you've got and use it as effectively as you can. All right. So you guys are here now. Um, you have the businesses. You have the products, right? So how do you position yourself? How do you market that product? How do you brand the product? And how do you make sure that you actually sustain it? What is a brand? A brand is a shorthand, a signature of what's behind the product or the service. Yeah. So you can't tell a lie all the time and get away with it. Yeah. So you have to improve the product, you yeah. have to improve the service, you have to have something unique about it. That's when you can build a brand around it. Yeah. Otherwise, the brand is just a shorthand of what is actually behind it. When you see Toyota, what does that sign mean? Or a Mercedes-Benz with that client, what does that mean? A BMW. It's the quality that goes behind it that really matters. That's when the brand comes up. And that's when marketing becomes easier, when you understand how to play with those values. But you can't tell a lie to all the people all the time and think you'll get away with it. Tesla has built his brand. Today, Elon Musk, the, most, the richest man in the world, because he's built his brand, what he says he does. But it takes 
almost, not ingenuity on its own, a degree of almost insanity to be so obsessed by something that you've got to be the best. That's what makes him so powerful. Um, Jeff Bezos with Amazon, he was so obsessed, took so many years to build his brand as Amazon. And he said, I'll supply everything from A to Z, A to Z, Amazon. The arrow goes from the A to the Z. And he wanted to do it efficiently. So he built, he built the most efficient e-commerce platform in the world and he scaled it. Now that's what it takes to build a brand. That's why Amazon is a brand, Apple is a brand, all these names, Microsoft. It's the product behind that matters. So you can't get away with something that doesn't have that quality. MTN in Uganda, in South Africa, is a brand. They had to come up with a product that was affordable, that was reliable, that would connect people and change people's lives. So building a brand and marketing, the two are slightly different. You can only market and build a brand when you've actually got a good product behind it. Otherwise, if you push too hard on marketing, you could get away and sell sand to the people in the desert for some time, but not very well. All right. Alan? Great. So I think how you, for, for a person who is starting out, Again, I'll use part of my story. Starting out, I think one is to make sure that you do what you say your product is going to do. Okay. And make sure that you focus on that, delivering that to the customer, because that's what Patrick was talking about, you know, making the customer happy. That's how I think you can easily market that particular product. So one of the ways that I usually tell people how to brand themselves and market themselves is you know, unless you're, you're, you're so big that, for example, uh, the Patricks of this world, when your product can sell itself, but if you're those upcoming businesses, I think one of the ways you can be able is to, you know, wear your brand on you. Have, make sure you have those conversations and you're able to network and talk as much as possible as you can about your brand and your product and what you do and go ahead and deliver on what you say you're going to do. I think that's that's the short. Awesome. So both of you um, are not just focusing on one pie. You actually have many pies around you because you've been able to grow your businesses. So how important is understanding trends and what's going to grow in making sure that you actually grow what you currently have? I can say something before that. Part of Taewo's journey with his gold mine company. Yeah. An important ingredient I have seen and why I see success in him is humidity. The fact that he has stayed behind and he's got that humility and he says that his business should be bigger than him, that element of humility eventually comes through. And that's a very powerful but understated value, especially for success in business. So that's something I wanted to compliment on what he said. Now back to what you were saying. You were asking if, how do we feel with our businesses today now that they have scaled? Should we diversify? Do, is the need for diversification as important? I think it comes back to putting all your eggs in one basket. And you, there's a fine balance there. If you diversify too quickly, you lose focus. If you focus on one area you, and you scale it, you can do extremely well by sticking to that. But then what happens when an external shock comes your way and impacts you. Today you have the Ukraine-Russia war. None of your business. You didn't create it. You've got nothing to say in little Uganda, but you're going to feel the impact of that. The global pandemic, we felt the impact of that. It forced us to become digital, to start marketing differently. So you've got to move with the trends. You've got to follow the trends. What's happening around? If you stay static, whatever made you successful yesterday and you keep doing that, it won't keep you in a safe place today and certainly won't be in the safe thing. You won't be in a safe place tomorrow. So you've got to evolve, you've got to follow the trends, you've got to read wide, deep, keep researching, keep your antennas up. And that way you stay relevant to the market, otherwise you become irrelevant to your customers and to everybody else. Awesome, I love that. I, I don't know if you need me to add to that. No, I don't. I think I understood him fully well and I'm so excited that he understands that you need to be nimble. In any market, you need to be nimble. You need to take opportunities and you really need to make them work in order to stay on top and obviously succeed. Oh, the other question that I would really like to, to ask you guys is um, we see you now uh, as you are and many people will take it for granted that Patrick is here now, Ellen is here. It's pure luck. What are some of the lessons that you guys actually have to share and your key wins, you know, that you hold on to in order to keep you above water 
and, you know, and keep you number one in all your competitive spaces. And to go with that, Alan? Okay, I think some of the lessons that, that I think uh, one of the biggest lessons for me has been discipline and focus. Not to easily lose focus and to keep your mind on the bigger picture. You know, where you want to go and the dream that you have. So to allow your the dream to drive you because that's what I find the biggest challenge in many people in, in, in my generation and people who are who begin to set out for success. Small small wins begin to distract them. So I think focus and discipline is one of those big, big, big uh, values that we need to have. But also again having a product that could somehow speak for itself. So one of the things that I've hardly in Goldmine, we've, we've just started to go out there and probably market this product. But mm -hmm. before that, we majorly depended on referrals. And you can only be referred if you've been handling clients right, if you've been delivering on what you say you're going to, to do, if your product you know, is a good product. So I think, I think those are some of the small things that I think have kept us on top. And also to, to know what's happening in the market you know, to know your industry. And these are things that I learned, by the way, from, <laughs> from most of, of our seniors, the, you know, Patrick and, 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 and some of the other people who have been speaking to us right. and telling us what to do in business. So for me, I think those are the small wins that I would talk about. Patrick? I think the things probably most understated are the lessons we learn from our mistakes. Mm -hmm. Because we're going to make mistakes. You will fall down several times, and, uh, and you've got to embrace those lessons so that you don't make the same mistakes or similar mistakes, those pitfalls. I spend time now trying to explain, especially to the youth, and to guide them, because they want that many people to mentor us in that way. There are many successful people, but they keep their secrets to their chest. They don't let their cards out. But you, you lose nothing. You can't drink the entire Lake Victoria just because you want to be successful. You can only drink so much water. So whatever knowledge you have, share it, pass it on. We are on a stage. Do your part and then move on. So the lessons we learn, because people now see the success only. They don't know what you went through to achieve that success. Yeah. They talk about Usain Bolt. Everybody knows he's the fastest man on earth. He probably still is the fastest man on earth. He only ran six races that really mattered. And that delivered him the first hundred million dollars and the world fame. And each race was less than 10 seconds. So if you combine the six races, it was a 60-second matter for him. But they don't realize that he spent 10 years in training for that one minute total. People don't realize what you go through before you hit success. By the time gold mine is where it is today, it's because of the hard work he's put in, the discipline, that resilience, and his forging ahead with a lot of challenges. It was not easy for him. And I've seen him come up, and I see him as a future leader, a business leader. Already in his game, he's doing so well without having to push so hard. Imagine if he had more, a turbocharge on him. So the sky is the limit for the young people. The population is growing. The demographics are good. The income levels are climbing. Everybody's aspiring for a better life, not just in Uganda, but in the whole region. So the business he's in, if he focuses and keeps growing it, that's what will transform people's lives. And it's giving to society a meaning, a purpose. It's very rewarding when you, you, you do something with a purpose, not just for the sake of making money. Awesome. And um, so how important is it for me as a business person or an entrepreneur to understand finances? If you don't understand finances, they say stick to, what, stick to knitting. If you're good at knitting, you stick to knitting. That, that, that's what will work for you. Otherwise, you've got to understand a little bit of financial literacy. And I'm not talking about the rocket science. You don't understand derivatives. You don't understand the stock market. It's okay. But you must understand that to make an investment, you need to make some savings. To make a good investment and make it grow, you need discipline. Sometimes you make some losses, so don't put all your eggs in one basket. There are certain basics, what I call financial literacy. Don't jump into hot water with both feet without testing the water. Oh, awesome. Yeah, I think, I, think, I think finances, you know, business is measured in numbers. Yeah. So the only way you can, you can do business is when you understand a bit about finances. You don't have to know all the nitty gritty, but you must understand when you're making a loss or when you're making a profit. It's that simple.
So if you can't understand that, then I don't know why you would be in business. Okay, this is my second last question. Um, so um, we, we've heard that Africa inter trade is dependent on, on entrepreneurs and what's going to grow our economy within Africa is actually the rise of entrepreneurs. So how do you think seasoned businessmen like the two of you can actually help in driving um, the growth around entrepreneurs in order to reach the goal that has been forecasted for Africa? Yeah, it's a tall order, and this can be a very long-winded question, Yeah, but I'll try and give it as quick an answer as possible, a short an answer to the point. What we need is an enabling environment. That's all we ask for. An enabling environment is what we ask the governments to provide. All right. If Africa, the Africa free trade continent, is going to, going to work, they have set a target of 2063, which I wonder why 2063, why so far? Yeah. Why can't we accelerate this? The young people, the youth, can't wait that long. We need them to remove the barriers to trade, remove the barriers, help us with the infrastructure so that it's easier, provide an enabling environment so that we can trade with one another. You don't have to trade with China only. If you want to go to West Africa, you first have to go to France. If you want to make a telephone call, you used to go to New York. All those systems have changed now. We are now interconnected. Foreign currency shouldn't be a challenge. We should be able to trade quickly and manage with our, with our reserves. But if everything's going to be based on the dollar and every payment has got to first be cleared in New York, we're going to stay in the same system. We've got to move forward. It won't happen overnight, but we've got to move forward slowly so that we can trade more efficiently. If it's going to be the dollar, it's going to be a Bitcoin, it's going to be a, whatever blockchain currency we use, it doesn't really matter. All I know is that we've got to interact much more and remove many of these barriers. Of course, there's a risk to removing the barriers too quickly. And uh, you get some wrong elements crossing from one uh, area to another. We've got to manage that, but learn and come out of it. We can't be so scared that we lock our borders and neighbors to one another simply are not trading. We've got to overcome that. And we've got to avoid wars, because typically in Africa, wars are the worst thing that they always taken up for. Right. And if you see how many countries are at war in Africa today, about 18 out of 56 countries today are at war. Why do we have war as the only mechanism to resolve our differences? Yeah. The youngest country, South Sudan, with so much potential, disorganized. Congo, the richest country in Africa, the biggest country in Africa today, disorganized. So war is a big challenge. Corruption, big challenge. So we need to get those values right. And lastly, institutions. We've got to build stronger institutions. These institutions will help. These are the building blocks mm. that will allow us to have this environment of trade. And then our continent is so rich. It's so endowed. We have so many people, young people with energy. And they've got values. We just need to be guided. Awesome. Alan? Well, I'm not sure I understood your question. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, if you think about the Goal for Gold platform, Obviously, it's a platform that's been built to say that as Goldmine Finance, we are able to give back to entrepreneurs in order to grow them. But however, the conversation shouldn't stop there. I mean, what are you doing as a leader of an organization to make sure that you give back? Remember, there's a life cycle of trade and businesses that we need to keep alive. So if you impart knowledge now on somebody else, you're keeping a whole system and whole ecosystem alive in the future. So what kind of conversations then would you like to have with the youth in order to make sure that you grow, you know, um, consumers for the future? Okay, so I think one of the things that uh, we've been able to do as Goldmine in that is mentorship, right? Yes. So we've been able to mentor, we've started with this small community of people who are, you know, really from, uh, who are who, people who wash clothes, people who, you know, uh, right border borders and that kind. And one of the things that we've, we've seen in that model is that people who did not have any form of savings, who are just sort of drinking alcohol and whatever, we, we, we looked at how, we were, how, how can we be able to help these people. Just gave them financial literacy, taught them how to save. And a person who started with saving, for example, something as little as 2,000 shillings, 5,000 shillings, today, in less than a year has got more than three million shillings in savings Which is awesome. and 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 i think for me i feel like there is no better way of giving back to that kind of person than teaching them the skill 
and the, giving them the tools that can help them better themselves. Right now, some of them, are they've started business, they're riding border borders from those savings. Another person started the soap making company, you know, and, and I feel like that is the best way of giving back to that kind of community and that kind of person, people who are dying of hunger during lockdown. So we started by giving them posho, and now they are, they are doing their own businesses and employing someone, you can, you can imagine. That's actually very awesome. I like the way you, both of you have actually spoken through to the question. Um, because it makes me realize that as an African, I've always been sold a story that I need help, that I am poor. So it's nice to know that we're able to uplift our own people and actually make our continent work as a very rich continent that it is. My last question is, so what are the things that you would do differently with all that you know now? Had you have to start a business now, what would you go back and change? A tough one. Maybe I wouldn't take so much risk. The time I started business, the market was almost virgin. The country was coming from a very low base and there were so many opportunities. So you, 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 you jump into businesses that you don't fully understand. You make some mistakes, make some money, lose some money. So if I'd focused and done fewer things, less stress, maybe I'd have had a better life and I've got the balance right between family and business. But to succeed at this level, something has to give. And it's a myth to think that you can balance family and business and be so successful. Something's got to trade off. So you're not there for your children, you're not there for your wife, for your family, for your relatives. You have to spend less time because you're trying to build a business. And that takes, like I said, at least 10 years. For me, almost 20 years to build a business where it is. So that time you cannot undo. You are not there to pick the kids up. You're not there to pick them up, put them to bed. You're not there to pray with them. Certain things you had to sacrifice because you're working. And that's what it takes to start up a business, build as a first time, uh, as a startup to, to be an entrepreneur. So those are things when I look back and say, did I do the right thing? Was it worth this struggle? And uh, I look back and say, maybe I should have thrown back a little bit. Of course, you want f success. You need finance. You need money because it gives you freedom. It gives you power to do what you want when you want and to provide for them. But ne some things are countless. Family is countless. There's no value to the family. Awesome. Alan? I think what I would do differently if I were to start all over again, uh, delegate more. I think that's one of the things that I would, I would do differently. Uh, you know, there are many mistakes that I probably made at that point. I probably would also want to do a, a lot of tax planning. All right. I've gotten to learn uh, quite a lot of recent from dealing with URA. You know, normally because when you're starting out in business, all you're focused on is probably <laughs> the numbers, the growth of the business. You don't know that there's a shareholder and a partner in the business. So one of the other things that I would do currently is a lot of tax planning for the business. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, it was really great to hear your inspiring journeys. Hopefully our audience has taken a, you know, a few notes on how they can do things differently. Uh, thank, thank you, you guys for joining us. Remember, go for gold. Follow us on Instagram at Goldmine Finance for more um, conversations around entrepreneurs, quotes and knowledge to start up businesses. Thank you very much. <laughs>